Thanks for joining us on Focus in Africa from BBC World News. Uh, we begin the program today with three women from different walks of life who've overcome personal battles to become ambassadors of hope. Simon Scott Sawyer, Janet McNeish and Rona Anderson are among the women who've chronicled their stories in an anthology called Navigating Life. They faced life-threatening health issues, grief and loss, but emerged stronger. Simone Scott Sawyer battled endometriosis. That's a condition where tissue starts to grow in other places, such as the ovaries and fallopian tubes. Janet McNeish was knocked down by a speeding vehicle in London just before COVID lockdown, and Rona Anderson overcame debilitating shyness by breaking the silence and she's now a happiness consultant. I caught up with the three of them and began by asking Simone how she managed to go about her daily life with the assistance of a catheter. With great difficulty. Um, the use of the catheter came about as a result of some complications that I suffered following the operation for um, endometriosis. So during the operation, the the bowels, as I mentioned, were covered with endometriosis. So the doctors had to cut large sections of my bowel away and join them back together again, effectively. And once doctors or surgeons, you know, cut you open and go inside and poke and prod various organs, it can have an effect on the functionality of those organs. So my bladder decided that um, it had had enough and it went into shutdown mode. A few days after the surgery, it became clear to me that I wasn't able to pee the normal way. You know, you feel the need once your bladder gets full, you feel the need to go to the bathroom. That was happening, but nothing was coming out. It was a most bizarre and bewildering experience. Um, and eventually the doctors decided that they had to self catheterize me. So the catheter was used, which is inserted into the urethra and that pierces the bladder. And effectively what happened was at that time, that catheter was attached to a bag that was wrapped around my leg. So every time my bladder would fill up, it would automatically just drain into, into the bag. While that was going on, another complication came about as a result of the bowel, which had been operated on, as I said, they had to cut a section away and join that back together. The point where it was joined together, Sophie, the sutures actually came apart and the bowel ruptured. So this happened while I'd you know, been sent home. I then had to go back to the, to the hospital. I was effectively you know, admitted again. Um, and what they then had to do was do another operation, joining the bowel back together again and disabling the bowel, if you like, giving that section of the bowel, the colon, where the endometriosis was, a chance to heal. But in giving it a chance to heal, I was given a bag, which essentially meant that I wasn't able to open my bowels in the traditional way, like you and I can now. And my body's waste was going into this bag, an ileostomy bag, which is a bit like a colostomy bag. So, yes, yeah, so there was a time I had two bags, you know, <laughs> for the bladder, for the bowel. And, yeah, it did make life quite challenging. Um, we'll come back to, to, you know, how speaking about this has transformed your life and, and the lives of others. But do you think there is a, a wider understanding of the condition now, uh, you know, across the world and among women especially? Um, Yes and no. So while I was going through that period and dealing with all the, the challenges, I did get heavily involved with the National Endometriosis Society, now called Endometriosis UK. And um, I got involved with advocacy work, to help to lobby Parliament, um, had an audience with Diane Abbott MP at one point, just as an attempt to help, you know, the society raise more awareness about the condition. I mean, after all, it affects one in 10 women in the UK, and it has a huge impact, you know, not just on the woman's personal life, but on her professional life as well. Um, there were times when I couldn't go to work simply because I was just so poorly and mm. incapacitated with the illness. So there has been some progress. Um, yes, I understand that now we have endometriosis clinics, where before, back then, you didn't have doctors who specialise in the condition. Now you have medical professionals who know a little bit more about the condition and able to help women who are, who are going through problems. Rona, I, I read about you and I, I read what you wrote about shyness and, and I'm just wondering what started this? Um, I was growing up in the 1970s and I was told because I was quite a talkative person way back then, I was told to speak when spoken to. I was 
told I was annoying because I spoke so much and I, I was told that I spoke Jabberwocky and nonsense. So to quieten me, I was told just speak when spoken to you. And I took that on board and I really did to a point when I became fearful of opening my mouth and shyness set in. There was that belief that whatever I spoke, nobody would be interested in, in hearing me. Um, whatever I did, nobody would be interesting. So I clammed up and that shyness was just, just came inwardly into me. And that's how it was triggered. Just expound a little on that, if you can. Um, if you can imagine being so fearful about how you're perceived, if you attempt to do something, you'll be ridiculed. And that's how I felt. I felt that I would really, really be um, laughed at. Even though I was more, even though I was able to do certain things, even though I was able to, um, to, to speak, to be creative, to do many, many things, I held back and it was that fear. It was debilitating, it was painful. Mm. Um, knowing that I could achieve but refused not to because mm. of the fear that was inside of me and the belief that I had about myself. But now here you are speaking uh, <laughs> quite boldly. How did you overcome all that? What was the process like for you? Well, um, I was deemed I acted shy for many decades and it wasn't until I realised that Shyness was fear, and shyness and of fear did not come from God. And then I realized if it's not from God, I it wasn't something I wanted, it wasn't something I wanted attached to me, it wasn't the label that I wanted to wear. So I just said, No, I refuse to be called shy, I refused to accept that label. And because I knew of the pain that goes with it, mm. I now try to stop other people from labeling themselves in that way. And okay, my label was shyness. Other people's label, labels may be something else. And if you're associated with something that you no longer feel is relevant to you, I said, don't accept it. That's what I did, I just did not accept it. All right, let me bring in Janet, because yours is also a story that made me cry, to be frank, when I, when, I, <laughs> when I was reading, knocked down by a vehicle during lockdown while crossing a street in London. I mean, you describe in slow motion exactly how that moment was like for you. I was walking across a pedestrian crossing in central London, I, and I noticed the car when I was halfway across, um, I noticed the car turning out that was parked. I noticed it was turning out, turning in my direction because prior to that, there was no indication it was there, but I was crossing and it was a main road, a very big road. So they could easily see me. So I was, walk so I was walking and I, they turned in my direction. I thought, oh, it's fine. They'll stop in a minute. There's plenty of room for them to stop. When are you going to stop? Then I realised they weren't stopping there. Bang. They, it hit me and threw me in the air. So, I, and I was lying on my back, but in the air, flying horizontally, and I could look down and see a car beneath me, then I felt a bang, another bang, and I felt another bang. So the, afterwards, I found out that, um, if, there's a lot that happened, but when I got to the hospital, the paramedics said that the passenger was crossing the road where she was struck by a vehicle, and then, they they traveled some distance and then the driver stopped and the patient fell into the road and then they talked about lots of numbers and my readings because i've been lying there with you know felt like it was very sudden but i don't, i passed out and was um yes so but i was aware of some things that were happening at the scene yeah um, yeah quite 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 descriptive you are actually and um of course, there was a healing process that you had to go through, really, to be frank, not just psychologically, uh, but physically. You write about the fear of crossing a road and the sound of vehicles. 
every time a car went past went past my house or in, in, in like I could hear it so even now I, when I could hear it I had that I had the, it triggered more of the flashbacks and the mm. flashback is is um, a memory that a traumatic memory it's, and, and you relive it it's not that you're remembering it it's as though you're experiencing it right now in the moment so every time I heard a car I just had that split second that I, I felt mm. that panic just before I realized that car was not going to stop and hit you know before I didn't have time to think wow and 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 you also talk about forgiveness and the process of forgiveness how difficult was that journey for you it was it was different it was difficult um I I I, I know that forgiveness, um, can I just say something about forgiveness, what it is and what it isn't, because there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. And as a therapist, I've helped, had to go through my own other journeys of forgiveness and help others. So forgiveness does not mean that what that person did was okay. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be a natural consequence or even a legal consequence for what someone's done. Um, if I had died, thank God I didn't. Um, if I'd have died, then they would have had been going to court for manslaughter and not just for driving without due care and attention yeah mm -hmm. so um there the forgiveness but obviously i couldn't forgive after i died <laughs> but forgiveness also doesn't mean that one needs to be reconciled with that person um not just in this context in any reconciliation recon forgiveness is for you it's about freeing i knew i had to forgive to free myself from um allowing any bitterness and resentment to grow in my heart and what kind of support did you get in order to navigate through this whole uh, this whole season I, because this happened just before lockdown so I came home and I had um came straight from the hospital after 17 days in a trauma unit they sent me home unable to walk and I they sent in physiotherapists district nurses um occupational therapists to help me for the first two weeks and then it was locked down there was a positive environment I was very careful about who I allowed to visit me as well I didn't want any negativity um or people to have to deal with people's sadness that sounds awful but you know they worry I didn't want to keep reassuring them so I I had so I spoke to physios on the phone I spoke to I looked at other people how do they cope with being disabled in a wheelchair um, looking at grief and loss. I, some of the exercises I use with my clients, I've look, I did some of them myself, looking mm -hmm. at where I am in the five stage stages of grief because my health and my life was not the same. I, I wonder whether you have questions for each other today. Um, you know, so many things that the doctors had said, there's no cure for your condition. I've managed to, you, you know, with the help of an amazing lady, find that natural remedies have reversed all my symptoms. Once I realised that, um, you know, even in that piteous state that I found myself in when my body was virtually, it had come to a standstill. I was barely functioning as a human being, let alone a woman. Mm. My bladder wasn't working, my bowel wasn't working, but that wasn't me. Once I made that switch in my mind, you know, at a spirit level, realized that there's more to me, I can beat this. Rona and, and uh, Janet, I, I'd, I'd like you both to say something. Basically, what would you tell the woman out there who is, uh, right now struggling with a situation that looks virtually impossible to overcome. I have a quote and it's from Richard Branson. It's a very popular quote from him. And it says, if someone offers you an amazing opportunity and you are not sure you can do it, say yes, then learn how to do it later. And that's transformed me a lot. Um, that's broken that shyness. It's a case of you know, opportunities come my way. They really, really do. And I've just got to say yes. Yes. And then find a way later how to do it. On the back of what Rona is saying, what, what I would say to, to everyone is no matter what you're going through, keep going because you will get through it. Um, there is help around you are valuable, intrinsically valuable, whether or not you can work or not or the fact that you're alive, that you were born, made by a powerful, loving creator, has, that alone gives you value, whether or not you're in connection with, that, with him. But you are still a valuable person. Do not give up on yourself. Amen. Simone, Janet, Rona, thank you so much. Yeah, very strong ladies there.